Today I'm looking through this year's International Landscape Photographer of the Year photographs and hopefully it'll inspire you as much as it has me. I saw a post recently on the International Landscape Photographer of the Year 2020 and some of the photos were just mind-blowing. So if you're feeling a bit down from either having to quarantine or you're stuck in lockdown or you're just not getting out that much, I'm going to show you some amazing images from some of the best landscape photographers on the planet. I got in contact with Peter Eastway, who is the chairman of the judges, so basically the big boss man, and he said yes to me doing this video, which is awesome. So if you're watching, thanks very much, Pete. I really appreciate it. And if you don't know who Peter is, he's the editor for Better Photography magazine and is a practicing Australian photographer known internationally. I first came across Peter and his work from his Creative Live session with his fine art landscape and travel photography course with Tony Hewitt, a fantastic course that's well worth watching. If you're interested, I've left all of the links for anything I reference in the description down below. And I've also left the link for the International Photographer of the Year website, as well as the Instagram and websites for the content winners. So definitely go and check them all out and follow them after watching this because they have many more amazing photographs as well as their contest entries. Now before I show you the images, I'll go through the competition format and there are a few different categories. Now if you want to skip this part and go straight to the photos, click on this time code. First of all, there is the Landscape Photographer of the Year and this is first, second and third and this is for a portfolio of their four best photographs. Then there is the Landscape Photograph of the Year, and again, it's first, second, and third. Each of the five judges give the entrants their score out of 100, and then this is tallied up and worked out as a percentage. If you get into the top 101, you make it into the book, and then your best four photographs will be considered for the Portfolio Photographer of the Year. Not all photos have to make it into the top 101, just one of them. Considering there were 3,881 entries this year, the judges had their work cut out for them. I bet it took ages to get through all of those and decide which ones were the better ones than others. They also had the Special Categories Award, and these are for ones that stood out to the judges in certain ways. First of all, in looking through these photos, part of me felt a little bit intimidated, but then another part felt really inspired, and this is what I'm taking away from this and I hope I can help you feel inspired as well. I've got some landscape photographs of my own that I'm quite proud of, but after looking at these, I know I've got a lot of work to get my photography up to the next level. And in going through this book, it's a great way to look at some amazing photographs, and then by analyzing these images, you can decipher how they took them, what maybe motivated them, and probably how much work they actually put into each of these photographs. You can download the PDF of the book on the Landscape Photographer of the Year website, or you can order it. I'll definitely be getting one in the new year as these images will just look amazing in print. Also, wouldn't it be great if maybe some of us were to kind of be inspired by this so much that we went out, worked on some new images of our own, and then maybe entered them next year or in the next few years. I'm just kind of putting that out there. For the record, I have nothing to do with this competition and I don't know any of the people that run it. I'm just an avid landscape photographer that has been inspired by these photographs. Also, if you do have any photos or sets of photographs in this competition, first of all, congratulations. All of the photos I've seen are absolutely amazing. And also, if I mispronounce your name, all I can do is apologize. I'm British and we're known for being rubbish at not only learning languages, but also pronouncing names from different countries. Now these are my opinions and you might agree or you might disagree, but that's okay. I love going through photographs and discussing what makes them good and what could be done to make them better. If you disagree on anything I say, that's fine. It's good to have a differing opinion and it's good to hear different people's opinions from different angles. And you kind of sometimes look at an image and then you might hear someone else's opinion from it, and all of a sudden you see that photograph in a different light. So if you do disagree, or if you have other ideas or other opinions on the photos, let me know in the comments below. It'd be great to hear your thoughts. Kelvin Yen won the Photographer of the Year this year. He's 24, from Hong Kong, been a photographer for six years, and shoots with a Canon 5D Mark IV and the DJI Mavic 2 Pro. 
In the book, he says he's been planning and shooting for this competition for the last four years. He obviously got to a certain level and wanted to prove himself. So he aimed at getting the best photos possible by planning, scouting locations, and probably with a lot of persistence as well, until he got the lighting conditions and the shot that he wanted. And then there's the post-processing he's learned along the way. He's definitely skilled at both taking photographs as well as getting the best out of them when editing. So this is his group of the four photographs. So they're four very different photographs from four very different locations. So this is his first one. And obviously this was one of the ones that made it into the top 101 photos. Kelvin's called this Mars and it's from Utah and it's the Capitol Reef National Park. Now I'm not sure whether this is sunrise or sunset. If you know this location, let me know if you know this actual place and let me know if you think it's sunrise or sunset in the comments below. The one thing I love about this shot is all of these leading lines. All of these ridges down below are all pointing towards this one rocky outcrop. Even the mountains in the background, even the sky, and even the clouds in the background as well, they all point to this one subject. So there's no getting around and there's no kind of wondering what the subject is in this photo. You know it's that big rocky outcrop. I love this photo and it does have a kind of a painterly look to it. If you look down the bottom here, it almost looks like it's painted. Now he's waited for that perfect light He's got his drone in the perfect position. I'm guessing this is with a drone. And if it's not, I apologize, but I'm guessing this is with a drone. And these ridges look huge below him. So the only way you could really do that is if there's another rocky outcrop that he's climbed up or with a drone. So he's waited for that perfect light to hit all of these ridges and they're really accentuating the ridges as well. If this was in the middle of the day, the light would be shining directly down onto this landscape and it would look quite flat. So in getting that first light or last light of the day, it really makes the shot pop. You can see that sunlight is hitting this rocky outcrop and it's hitting all of these ridges and it's hitting this mountain range in the background as well as these clouds on the left hand side. So the sun, that golden light is really kind of making this image what it is. As I've already spoken about, Kelvin took four years to get his photographs in this competition. So he will have spent a long time in getting each of these images and getting each of these images exactly how he wanted it. Now, this is the second one that came into the top 101. Now, I don't actually like this photo that much. I think it's quite busy with these two trees in front, but that shows that the judges have a different opinion to mine. And this is the great thing with photography. Some people can like a shot and some people can not like a shot. And it's fine, it's okay, it's one of those things. Now the location is fantastic. It's in Norway, in Tromso. Obviously we've got the Northern Lights in the background. I just think it's quite busy with these two trees in front. It's great how they're framing this mountain in the background, but I think if I'd have taken it, I'd have had the mountainscape and the Northern Lights as the main subject, and then maybe one of these trees balancing it to one side. But Kelvin did choose a nice photograph and the judges really liked it and it made it into the top 101. One other thing to mention on this as well, he's got a shot of the Northern Lights and a lot of the times in Norway and in Iceland and probably in Canada as well, unless you actually live there, it's really hard to plan a trip where you, in those two weeks, you're going to get the Northern Lights and you're going to see those Northern Lights. So again, he's probably planned this for a long time. He's gone at the right time of the year. He's just gone to the location time and time again. And he's probably scouted this location as well. If we move on to the next one, this is in Italy in the Dolomites and it's basically where you have what's known as a conglomerate where it has big chunks of rocks, small chunks of rocks and it's all surrounded by a sediment. These rocks are a lot harder so they don't erode but then all of the sediment erodes around them and with these they protect that sediment below them making these pillars. He's got a really nice spot here where he's kind of following the rule of thirds. So you've got the two rule of thirds lines coming down and also if you go across, this one is on one of those intersections of the thirds or really near it. One other thing to look at is that it's misty. And so he's waited for the right conditions. He's probably thought, when am I most likely to get mist in this location? That's the great thing. When you're getting shots like this, if you have mist or fog in the shot, it can really give depth and atmosphere to that shot. So I'm guessing he knows this location, he's been to it, he's scouted it, and he's planned it, and then he's just waited for that misty morning and then he's got the shot. It's a fantastic shot. I prefer this one over the one in Norway, over that last one. 
His fourth shot didn't get into the top 101 either. And this is in Scotland and he called this one Flow. Now he really has made this one look fantastic in using a long exposure with the water in the foreground. I'm guessing he hasn't done a really long exposure, but I'd say maybe a quarter of a second to maybe half a second. I don't think it's any more than half a second, but yeah, it gives this again, a really nice painterly look in this water. And this water really does draw the eye down into the valley. I'm not sure where this is in Scotland, if you do know, let me know in the comments below because it looks like a fantastic location. We've got the normal stormy skies of Scotland and then we've got the light coming in from the left, tucking in just underneath those clouds. It is a fantastic shot and I'm guessing from where he was standing, he was either in the river or on a rocky outcrop in the river. Camera on a tripod, long exposure shot, blurring that water into the shot. I like these dark patches on the sides as well. It kind of makes your eyes squeeze through the middle and then back out into the landscape in the distance. So this shows that you don't have to be in the golden hour. You don't need those clouds catching that perfect light. The sunlight can be quite moody and the skies can be quite cloudy and you can still get a really good landscape shot. And I think the storminess of this really adds to this shot. Joshua Snow came in second place and he's a photographer from the States. Now, this first one is absolutely fantastic. I love this shot. It's just the look of it and the feel of it. It's like it was taken on a completely different planet. This was taken in the New Mexican Badlands in Southwest USA, and he called this interstellar for obvious reasons. The one thing I love about this is just there's, he's got circles, there's another circle there, there's another circle there, and this looks like another big circle there. He's exposed the sky really well, and it looks like it's all lit from the left-hand side. Now, this could have been a blend where he took the last of the sunlight just as it was dropping below the horizon, probably into blue hour, or there could have been some light pollution, or it could have been a rising moon or even a setting moon. But the main thing is that it's lit from the left-hand side of the frame. And this is giving great detail on all of these subjects. If you look at this one in the middle, it's darker on the right-hand side than the left-hand side. So this shows that the light was coming in from that left-hand side. And we can see that in the sky as well. There's a bit of light here bleeding through in the sky. One other thing I love about this one is the way that Joshua has edited those tones. He may have got these in camera, but then I think he's added to them when editing afterwards because it's all got that really nice blue look to it. And it all blends in and it all looks like it belongs there. It all looks like it is from another world. It's fan I love this one, it's fantastic. Josh's second image is from Patagonia in Argentina and it's the Laguna Torre in the El Chalten. And he's called this one Odin Spear for obvious reasons where you've got this massive spike in the mountains in the background. You can see Joshua has gone to this location. He's planned it, probably scouted the location again, and he's just waited for that perfect light. And also he's got lucky with that sun catching these clouds. Just looks fantastic. Now, if I was being really picky about this photograph, one thing I'd say is where this rock sticks into the shot. It'd be great if it lined up perfectly with this V up here. So we've got this V up here and then that V would be reflected down here. It would be an absolutely perfect shot if this rock sat perfectly in this V. But obviously, I haven't been to this location and there would have been a reason why Joshua hadn't moved to that point. There may have been something next to him, it may have been where he was standing or where he was able to stand, but again, that's me being picky and it's a fantastic shot. It's in that golden hour, whether it's in the morning or the evening, I don't know, but it's catching those clouds in the sky and it's actually catching those mountains in the background. And then we've got the reflections of that as well. So a really well thought out and well planned shot. Joshua's third image is from the Oregon coast. This didn't make the top 101, but it still is a good image. You've got this really moody sky and then you've got the sun poking out underneath that sky. And then we've got some motion in the water as well, coming through this gap in the rocks. Now, what would have made this photo better was if that sun was catching these clouds. But you can go to a location time and time again and not get those absolutely perfect conditions. But Joshua's shown that you can get a really nice image 
when you don't get those perfect conditions. If you think about it right, and if you plan it right, and if you get that composition exactly where you want it. And again, it's thinking about the compositional rules. If we look at those compositional rules, the sun is kind of bang in the middle from left to right. It's just a little bit higher top to bottom. If we were to draw the rule of thirds lines down on this one, either side, and across on this one, this rocky outcrop in the background would sit on one of the intersections of the rule of thirds. And then where the water is coming through, there's kind of a, a line that draws your eye into the sunset. So that comes in and around, but it's a great moody shot of the Oregon coastline. Onto Josh's fourth image, and this is Mount Rainier near Seattle. So another amazing part of the country. And he's captured this one beautifully got the cloud wrapping over the top of the mountain and then you've got these lenticular clouds in the top right hand corner. This has been taken in the golden hour and as well as that light giving different colours in the sky it also side lights these plants in the foreground making them really pop out of the shot. For me my eye is drawn to the plants and then I look up and into the shot to the mountain and to the bright sky to the left and then to the lenticular clouds to the right and back down to these trees in the midground. It's following that classic landscape rule of having a foreground, a midground and a background. Also, there's such a range of colors from the yellows and reds of the sky, purples and blues in the sky and also in those plants in the foreground to the different shades of green in the midground. I've been on Josh's Instagram page as well and he's got some fantastic shots there. So, like I said, the links are in the description below. Head over to his website and check out his fantastic work. In third place, we have Isabella Tabacci from Italy. And again, she's got some phenomenal images. They're just, all of these images are so good, but it is great to look through them. So if you look at her first one, this is in Kamchatka in Russia. Now this is a classic landscape shot. You've got these yellow rhododendron in the foreground, they kind of give this S shape. So your eye kind of draws around and then up to the mountain in the background. Some really nice side light. This is coming in and it's catching these parts of the snow in the midground, and it's catching the volcano in the background perfectly. Then the air is being forced up over the mountain, causing this cloud to sit on the top of the mountain. Really nice image, lots going on, but one of those classic landscape shots. And obviously this made the top 101. The second of Isabella's work is also from Kamchatka in Russia, and this is a lava flow formation in the foreground. She's obviously done a lot of scouting to find this location and to find this feature in the lava flow. This is Pahoehoe lava, I think it is, and it's that nice rippled smooth flowing lava. You've got nice sort of lines flowing around in here, and your eyes kind of catch here, come around and then into the shot. And this shows how important a really interesting and a kind of a flowy foreground is. You don't want just a foreground for the sake of the foreground. You want the foreground to mean something. And because it's all a lava flow and you've got what looks like a volcano in the background, it all kind of links together. And again, perfect golden hour light. Again, I'm not sure if this is sunrise or sunset. I'm guessing maybe sunrise with the haze in the background, but I could be wrong. But again, the light is capturing the lava flow perfectly. And you can see you've got the contrast giving that detail and giving the photo that three dimensionality. So it really makes the photo pop. Onto Isabella's third image. And this is from Switzerland. And this is obviously Zermatt and it's the Matterhorn, um, a very, very famous mountain in Switzerland. Again, she's got it in the golden hour. And you have this beautiful light hitting these trees and then hitting the side of the mountain as well. Again, giving it that three dimensional look. Looks in the foreground that the sunlight may not have hit this. I think she may have done some editing. I could be wrong. I apologize to Isabella if I am wrong, but I'm just kind of guessing after looking at the photos. But again, a nice foreground feature and you're following those classic landscape rules of having a foreground, a midground, and a background. And they're all fantastic in their own right, but when you put together, it really gives you a lovely landscape photograph. And Isabella's called this the roots of eternity. So you've obviously got some old roots of some old trees that are long gone, and these kind of link into the trees in the midground, and then your eye kind of draws up to the mountain in the background. 
It's a shame this sky didn't have more of these kind of wispy clouds going all the way through it, but you can't have everything. I'm guessing Isabella has done a lot of scouting and a lot of preparation for this photograph, or it might have been one of those ones where she was on a big hike and she found this location. Even if it was that second case, she's really planned it and she's gone for a hike when the light is gonna be good. So in that sunrise or in that sunset light. And it's all about going out at the right time of the day to optimize your conditions that you go out in and optimize the light that you might get for the photographs that you're taking. Again, this is just me guessing, and I could be completely wrong, but this is what I'm getting from the photo. But it's a fantastic photo. Now, Isabella's fourth photo didn't make it into the top 101, but obviously they take your four best ones for the portfolio. This is taken in Deadflay in Namibia, and it's that very famous dried up lake with all these dead trees. And I've seen so many photos of this location, but I haven't seen one at night like this with the Milky Way in the background. Looks like she's either got some shooting stars or maybe a few satellites probably not many planes going through the sky at night at that time. Again, it's got that kind of painterly look. It almost looks like it's painted in the foreground. I'm guessing there's so little light in this location and it was probably a Bortle 1 location, if not a Bortle 0 location, because that sky is fantastic. There's no light pollution anywhere near this. And I bet it was amazing to see this sky at night. I think this place closes at night, so she must have got a trip in and camped overnight at this location. But a really nice astrophotography shot with these two trees in the foreground. So the next category is the International Photograph of the Year. So this is for a single photograph. And this was won by Kai Hornung. Kai is from Germany, is a semi-professional photographer, and his day job is a human resources consultant in the financial industry. He shoots with the A7R 3 and a range of G Master zoom lenses from the 16 millimeter range right through to the 400 millimeter range. So he has the 16 to 35, probably a few in between, and then the 100 to 400 millimeter lens as well. All fantastic bits of glass. He's also got the Sigma 14 millimeter F1.8 for night photography. As well as all of this, Kai uses the Mavic Pro 2 for all of the aerial shots that he gets. So this is Kai's winning image and it has so much color and it's got so much going on in the photograph. Obviously the subject is the stream itself. It's amazing how it winds through these really colorful mountains. Again, he's got the light coming in from what looks like the left-hand side. So the cliffs on the left-hand side are in the shade and the cliffs on the right-hand side are catching that light. It's a very busy shot, but there's no doubt as to what the subject is. It's a really interesting shot as well. It kind of draws your eye up the river, and then your eye comes back down, looking at all the cliffs and mountains around it. I could be wrong, but I'm guessing he took this with his drone, maybe? If you know this location, and you know that there's a vantage point that you can stand at to look at this, let me know in the comments below. But I think this was taken with the drone. This was in Iceland, in the Highlands, so the north of Iceland. And Iceland itself is a fantastic landscape photography location. There's so many different places and so many different subjects to photograph there. You could probably spend months, if not years, there. In second place, Dipanjan Pal from India got this shot. This is definitely a drone shot and it, it, just, it just looks out of this world. The composition is fantastic. He's got that road running straight through. He's waited for a car, or well, that might have even been his car, but he's waited for that car there. So yeah, it's a, it's a really good shot, and it does look otherworldly. Dipanjan has taken this in southern Iceland, and there's no doubt that this is from Iceland, because like I've said, from Kai's photograph, there's some amazing and so different landscapes in Iceland, and this is one of those ones, and it kind of shows the scale of things in Iceland. Look how small that car is compared to the size of the river. And this is probably just a small section of that riverbed. It looks like it's a huge part. Really nicely framed. And it's got that bird's eye view looking down. And again, the light is coming from the top left hand corner. We can see these shadows here. So he's waited for the sunlight just to hit this part. The top part looks like it's in shadows and the bottom looks like it's in shadows as well. So there was probably patchy cloud about and knowing Iceland, it was probably quite tumultuous weather as well. In third place, Chance Alred from the United States got this shot and it's Hanksville in Utah. 
and it's of a sunset shot. It's a fantastic shot. We've got this leading line coming up to this spike of rock in the middle. The sun is also catching the bottom of these clouds and it looks like it's raining in the distance or there's at least some movement of that moisture in the distance. The sun is catching the side of these cliffs perfectly. I love this shot, this is fantastic. If you think about the rule of thirds, he's following those. Whether that was a conscious decision or subconscious decision, with these really good landscape photographers, they almost kind of follow and break the rules subconsciously. So this is just a lovely framing. It kind of draws your eye up to the spire and then you kind of, your eye lulls around this cloud or, well, my eye does anyway. And it comes down to these cliffs and you kind of explore the darker areas around here. Really nice shot. I love this one, it's fantastic. As well as those two parts to the competition, there's also the specialized categories. And these are the ones that stood out to the judges in certain ways. So there's five different categories that the judges have picked out. And the first one is dark and moody. And Grant Galbraith from Australia won this one. Really is dark and moody. This is a monotone image and it's a long exposure of this waterfall. And the waterfall really does pop out to you. And again, with this shot, there's no denying what the subject is. He may have done some dodging and burning with this. It's quite dark around the edges, or that may have been just the light on this occasion. The light looks like it's coming in from the top left-hand corner, and it's lighting that waterfall really nicely. But yeah, I'd say there's probably a bit of dodging and burning in this, and as well as the mist coming off that waterfall. So that's probably the, the water that the waterfall is chucking into the air. It's causing these sort of misty areas to rise off that waterfall, but it looks like a fantastic shot. And it's definitely worthy of the Dark and Moody Award. The Amazing Aerial Award went to George Popper, I think, from Romania. I've probably pronounced that wrong. Kind of looks like George, but George, if you are watching this, I apologize for mispronouncing your name. Um, but this shot, I love this shot, it's fantastic. There's lots going on. Now I'm not sure if they drop the saturation or whether it looks like this anyway. It could be either. But the one thing I love about this is the diagonals. You've got this one diagonal coming through here between the snow and what looks like a dark sediment. And then you've got this opposing diagonal coming in from the sunlight. So all of those shadows from all of those trees, that diagonal is opposing this diagonal. And then because they've shot it with a really wide angle lens, you have the kind of concentric trees coming out. So the further we get to the edges, the trees are longer than these trees in the center. And that's because it's distorting with that wide angle lens. That distortion is really added to this photo. Sometimes you can get distortion in shots that it kind of takes away or makes the photo worse. But in this one, it really adds to the shot. Now I really like this because you've got all of the trees pointing into the middle. You've got this diagonal line and you've got those opposing shadows coming the opposite way. Obviously this was taken with a drone, bird's eye view looking straight down. Next we've got the Snow and Ice Award and Hong Zhen Chiang from Taiwan won this one. And again, this shows that you don't have to be at a location with that perfect sunset or sunrise light coming into the shot. This is really dark and moody and it all kind of fits together. It kind of gives you that sense of a really wintry shot. Got the ice melting in the foreground. That looks like it's a long exposure shot. If that is water, it looks like it's blurred over more than two or three seconds. It might even be even longer. And again, Hongzhen is following those landscape rules. So you've got this foreground area here. You've got the midground where you've got this snow with these nice kind of diagonals coming through it. And then you've got the mountain in the background. Really nice, moody, wintry shot. For the Night Sky Award, Himadri Buyan from India won with this one. Now this is a really long exposure with a waterfall and then I'd say an even longer exposure with the sky because to do star trails like this, it does take a while. It's quite a few hours that he's taken this. I can't, I'm not gonna work it out, but that's quite a few hours of exposures of the stars to get this. I'm not sure with the waterfall whether he's light painted it or whether the moon was out or whether there was a bit of light pollution lighting this or he just did such a long exposure that there was enough light for the camera to soak up. But it's a really nice exposure. You kind of got this diagonal coming through and then you've got the splaying of the water in the foreground which kind of draws your eye into this point and then up to that circle in the sky. Really nice, unique looking shot of star trails. 
So the fifth of the special awards went to Evan Will from Canada. This was for the Incredible Horizon Award. Now this looks like one of the old screens from one of the Mac, I can't even remember which operating system it was, the one before Catalina or maybe Catalina. It's a fantastic Dune and Evan has captured it perfectly with that perfect side light and then with these ripples leading your eye in from that foreground into the dune. And then a long exposure has drawn the sky out. And it really is everything, again, it's pointing to that dune in the middle. All of these clouds are pointing towards the dune. These lines are drawing your eye up into the dune and that golden light hitting the side of the dune looks fantastic. It's got so much detail and it just makes the image pop. So one thing I'm learning from going through these images is that the photographers have taken a lot of time to get their images. They've done lots of planning and lots of scouting. And they've waited for the light to be in the perfect direction for the composition that they've chosen. Or they've either maybe got lucky, but they've planned it. There's definite planning to all of these images. Sometimes you can plan a shot, and when you go to that location, the first time you get there, you get perfect light. Other times you'll go, you'll keep going time and time again, and you won't get it right. I think I've mentioned this before, but I've been to one location in the UK where I think I went there 10 or 12 times before I got the shot that I wanted. It was that persistence that got me the shot. So that's the main thing I'm taking from this. It's all about scouting, planning, coming up with ideas, literally going out and finding locations and then planning the shot. So going back to that location time and time again. Sometimes as amateur photographers, you might not be able to get that kind of privilege or you may not be able to get out there and do that. But if you organize a trip to a certain location or if you have a location near you, you can keep going back at weekends until you get that right light. And that's what landscape photography is all about. It's that persistence, it's that going out there and getting the shot. It's going out there until you get those right conditions. Now I'm rambling on a little bit, but this has really inspired me to go out and get some shots and to really think about my landscape photography and how I can drive it forward. Next, we've got the top 101 shots. I'm not gonna go through and talk about every single shot, but I'm gonna flick through them and I'm gonna talk about the ones that really stand out to me. Again, there are some fantastic shots. This one by Gary Hunter, side lit from the left, really nice moody sky in the background. It looks like he's dropped the saturation to give that monochrome effect to the shot. This next one from Mila Yao was taken in Java, which is one of the islands in Indonesia. Java is a fantastic place to photograph. I've been there quite a few times. This is a really unique shot. It looks like a full on composite shot, I think he's just got this with a really wide angle lens. But it's a very unique shot. We've got this waterfall in the background, moody sky in the background, and this very green foliage, which is kind of indicative of the tropics and of Indonesia. This next one's from Indo as well, and this is Java. This is Bromo. I've been to this location and it's fantastic. It's good how he's kind of framed the mountains with the trees. For me, this one looks a little bit overprocessed almost too much saturation there, but it's a good shot nevertheless. And it looks like he's got to the location and there's not much going on in the sky. So he's chosen this location to look through the trees at those mountains. And again, the light is coming from the left. This is a sunrise and it's just capturing these mountains. And Bromo itself is just puffing away. It's an active volcano. And Semeru in the background, that's puffing away as well. If you ever get the chance to go to Indonesia, it's fantastic and it's well worth going. This place is like some kind of moonscape. It's a fantastic place to go there and you will get some fantastic photos. This next one from Miller, it's a moonset and this one is in Java as well. This is Aijan Volcano, another active volcano. I think down here you have sulfur miners, but you have this really nice big blue lake with this kind of dead tree in front of it. It's a really nice composition and he's got lucky where there's not much cloud in the sky. There's kind of wispy clouds, but not much more than that. I've been to this location and it was raining the whole time that we were there. This is a nice close up from Andrew. And again, it's that kind of juxtaposition with that leaf. So a nice bit of brown color with the blues and whites of the ice. This next one from Nick Green, it's of a wooded area and it looks like a really old wooded area because everything's covered in moss. 
One thing I'd take from this is it's worth going when it's misty or waiting for that mist to come in and then going to that location. Now this next one from Nicholas, he's named it nicely, it's the Matrix, and it really does remind you of those green numbers going through in the film, The Matrix. This is what looks like elongated bubbles in an ice flow. This is in Sweden, in this, I'm not even gonna name <laughs> the national park, but you can see the writing down on the bottom of the screen. Looks like he's up the contrast to make it really pop, but yeah, fantastic shot. Wow, so this is a fantastic shot from Frederick. Um, yep, this is Kansas in the United States. So this is where you have all those amazing storms. You always get those storm chasers. Fantastic cellular cloud with fantastic lightning. This is such a good capture. I'm wondering if he's either got this by doing a time lapse or whether he's got this by having a, a lightning trigger. So you can get an attachment for your camera which when it sees the flash, it fires the shutter. It's almost like the opposite to the slave mode in flash units. So say if you've got a flash over there and you've got a flash on your camera, as you fire this one, it fires that flash. It's a similar trigger to that. But yeah, that's a fantastic shot and really nicely framed. It's obviously quite a long exposure because the grass in the foreground is all quite blurred, but that adds to it, it adds to the storminess of it. So this is Daniela. This was taken in Western Australia. It looks like a bird's eye view of a river and quite a long exposure. So this looks like a river and it looks like it's all blurred, whereas the surrounding parts aren't blurred. So that's what I'm getting. You've got water flowing through this straight part of the river. I could be wrong, but that's what it looks like to me. Again, fantastic shot, a very unique shot as well. We've had a look at Chance's shot. They were in the top three. And again, a well-deserved top three. This is the second one by Chance Allred. A fantastic sunrise pano. This is in Utah. You can see the golden light is hitting these top cliffs, but it hasn't hit this bottom part yet. And that's why it's quite blue. So the blue shadows are contrasting with the yellow cliffs. Fantastic shot, really nice shot. I'm guessing this has taken quite a lot of processing to, to get it looking like it is. And probably with that sunlight and with these shadows, probably bracketed the shot as well. Now this looks like it's been taken at the same location as Kelvin, but from obviously a different angle, the sun's in a different position. It does look like Chance likes getting the sun in the shot. What I like about it is the way that the light hits these parts. And it shows you can go to a location and get a completely different shot from other photographers. So it looks like Chance has spent a lot of time in the Capitol Reef National Park. I'm not sure if this is time blended, but we've got the night sky with Neowise in the background, a really nice capture of that comet. And we've got the sunlight coming in and hitting these pillars from the left-hand side. So I'm guessing it's a time blend because you normally don't get that many stars when the sun is coming up. Another way you could get a shot like this all in one shot is if it's the moonlight coming and hitting these pillars as well from the left-hand side. So it could be either moonlight hitting these monoliths on a long exposure, or it could be the sunlight that he's blended into the shot. There's many different ways to create an image like this. This shot by Kevin, I'm guessing because it's in the Netherlands, it's rows and rows of flowers, and you've got this watering system at the top. He's got his drone looking straight down. He's framed it really nicely. He's used those straight lines as part of the composition and those different colors within those straight lines. This next shot by Zhu Zhao. Got the northern lights to the left-hand side and what looks like either a bit of light pollution from over their left shoulder, because we've got the shadows here, and it must have been cold at this location. It looks so cold. It'll have taken a long exposure because we've got a starry sky as well, and obviously to get those northern lights that bright. Again, you can see those trees are the main subject, and it's kind of backed up by the starry sky, and the northern lights, and the blurred clouds in the background. Now, one of my favorite things are waves to photograph, and they can create some amazing shapes and amazing patterns. Gurjo, or I think that's how his name's pronounced, has got an amazing shot of this wave and it's backlit from the left with the sun. You can see there's quite a moody sky in the background, but the sun is coming through and hitting this wave. And that's what gives this photograph life, that backlight from the sun in the distance. Again, it's either at sunrise or sunset, but it's near the golden hour and that green of the water really stands out and it makes this image really pop. Wow, look at that. So this is another shot by George. He got into the top three of the photograph of the year. 
This, I'm guessing, is taken with a drone, but those colors are fantastic. Just those yellows coming into the shot and this riverbed. And that looks crazy. I really like that. You've got diagonals from the riverbed going one way, and then with all of those tributaries, diagonals in the opposite direction. And the yellow areas look like they could be tops of ridges, and the color really makes them look like they're a lot taller, and that color really does stand out. After doing a little bit of research on George's shot called Burning Feathers, this has a tragic story behind it. It's about a Romanian village called Giamana in the Apiceni Mountains as a result of copper mining. This beautiful image is the result of the different toxins, metals and waste from the mining process being dumped in the valley, drowning that village. Now I've left a few links below as it is quite an interesting and pretty tragic story. So this shows that there can be a much deeper story behind certain images and photographs. This next one by Roxol Yana is fantastic. Got the Northern Lights, got a big mountainous outcrop in the distance, and then we've got this ice in the foreground that's kind of breaking up and it's forming all these different kind of shapes and patterns, And but we've got the reflection of the Northern Lights in this as well. Again, it's following those rules of landscape. We've got a foreground, we've got a midground, and then we've got the background, which is the Northern Lights. And it shows that if you follow the rules and you get some unique looking conditions when you get to that location, you can make an image really pop and you can make an image really stand out. Wow. Not sure if it's sunrise or sunset, but it's in the golden hour. But this landscape is fantastic. And all of these ripples, it's amazing how he's caught the light on those ripples. And it's all about that light being low in the sky, capturing all of that detail on the surface. But yeah, this is fantastic the way that kind of draws your eye up to the sun. We've got this kind of S shape, and the blueness of the lake as well. As well as the brilliance of the sun, the colors really make this one stand out. You have the blue of the lake, which contrasts the yellow of the surrounding landscape and that sky. These colors are on the opposing sides of the color wheel. And normally if you choose colors on the opposing sides, they do complement each other quite well. And Tony has used this technique perfectly in this photograph. I definitely think that this is a bracketed shot, and in times like these, it's great that we have such amazing cameras at our disposal. So I hope I've inspired you with this video. I was really inspired by these photographs, and I probably could have carried this video on going through all of the 101 photos, but I didn't want to put you through that. And one thing I found by looking through all of these images is that these images are quite attainable by all of us. It's just going out there and doing it and going out and getting those images and going out when those conditions are right. You can get shots like this, I can get shots like this and we all can. It's just putting in the time to get those images. But go to the International Landscape Photographer Video website, download their PDF or even buy the book and have a flick through those photos. They're so inspiring and there's so many good photos in that book. It's well worth getting. Like I've already said, I'm gonna be buying it in the new year. If you can't afford it, just download the PDF and then you'll be able to see it on your laptop or on your computer. You'll be able to see how amazing all of these photos are. They really do inspire me. I hope they inspire you as well. Now, after all that, if you still wanna learn more about photography, click on this video next. And if you want to binge watch a load of photography tutorials, click down here. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe for weekly tutorials in photography and videography. I'll see you next time.